Thank you to Third Place Books. Thank you to all of you for coming. It's funny, I'm still getting used to that author thing. Because really, in my mind, I'm just a street girl. I've been around for a while. And thanks to many of my friends who are like, Lisa, you have to write a book. Because I don't really consider myself a writer. Um, but I did realize that I had learned some things. And it was important to share. And I'm very much committed to raising up new generations. And you know, my friend Lori said, Lisa, only so many people can come to a training. But a book can spread the word much farther. And I've learned today, because I figured I should ask my publisher, how many have been sold? And they said, oh, 5,000 so far. So in the book world, that's actually not bad in this day and age. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. So I want to um, just start by recognizing today is Tuesday a work day. And many of you may have had a busy day. Anybody have a busy day? I had a busy day. I want to just take a minute to sort of bring ourselves present here. And I wonder if people just want to take a breath and think about all those distractions in the world and sounds around us and just sort of, sort of pull all that in. Yeah, I see some of you are closing your eyes. Feel free to if you'd like. You know, start letting some of that go. The craziness, the news, this president, the destruction, all of these things that really can destabilize us. And I also want to take a moment and a breath to think back on the indigenous people of this land who were the original stewards, who are still today, their descendants, teaching us how to be in right relation and reminding us daily that this is the only planet we have this is the only water we have. This is the only air we have. And if we care about our lives and the lives of future generations, it's time for us to start rising up. Because that clock is ticking. So I just want to express my gratitude to all of the teachers and all of the young people who are teaching us as well that we need to show up for them and for the land. You know, I, um, I wrote this book because I did not come from a political family. I just learned by doing. And there were lessons along the way, two fundamental ones. There's injustice and that people working together can actually change our conditions. And I have, um, for whatever reason, that has fueled a life of what I consider service. And it's also been a life of abundance. I often say that I'm wealthy, even if I have no money. I consider my currency to be energy and the ability to actually show up with other people to do what needs to be done. And I've learned a lot of things. Like when I started out as a young woman, I didn't know anything, really. And I, as I get older, I can begin to look back and see you know, what those lessons were, even if I didn't really understand them in that moment. And so this book tour has been giving me an opportunity to share some of what I've learned. And you know, I started to write this book in 2012. I had done a 56-page manual called Kick and Corporate Booty in two days that helped support a number of national community-based organizations, throw down some significant weeks of actions around the financial crisis back in 2011. And I was like, damn, if I could get that book done, in t that manual done in two days, I can get the book done in a year. Well, seven or eight years later, <laughs> Shut It Down is finally here. And in the process of writing it, well, a couple things happened. One, I kept organizing. And it's interesting because as I kept organizing, I was involved in mobilizations and movements that continued to help me actually get the book done. In particular, the two most important, well, there was Occupy, of course, but was what happened in Ferguson and Standing Rock. And it was through those two mobilizations I began to understand at an even deeper level what I think is one of the most important lessons. And that is if we don't do the healing that needs to be done, 
to build healthy movements, I think our time on this planet and the prospect of a healthy future is seriously in question. You know, I'm not like a conspiracy theorist. I'm not somebody that believes it's all going to come down in one fell swoop. But I've been watching what's happening around this world. The fires, the floods, the storms, and the rise of white supremacists, and the death and the destruction that has come from that. When the Arctic started burning this summer, I don't know about any of you, but I could hardly bear it. And then when the Amazon. And so the change that is underway is undeniable. But I haven't yet seen us rise to the level of organizing that I think is essential. So some of the pieces that you know, it was actually after standing like I came home and I was like, you know what? We got to do something different. And I'd always had a vision of an organizer's network. How do we build a movement of movements? And then I also had this vision about a trainer's network. And then I realized it was really one and the same. And I had hopes of putting that in place, but I knew if I tried to do that, the book would still not be done. But I'm still holding that vision. And I keep imagining, what does solidarity really look like? How do we actually come together across movements? And during that first year of the sabbatical, there was a huge flood in Austin. A thousand homes went underwater. A number of people were killed. Uh, n numerous wildlife and animals were killed. And so we put together a response effort similar to what was done in Katrina after, after the Hurricane Katrina. And it was in that process that I began to see more and more how communities can actually come together to not only support each other in the midst of disaster, but to be organizing today in this moment to prepare ourselves what might, what might lie ahead. And I think that's actually one of the pieces that I'm carrying right now, is how do we build authentic relationships that allow us to show up with one another? Because in this dominant culture, white supremacist culture, we've all been raised to behave in certain ways. We, we're very individualistic. We distance from one another. We think that we're the, our way is the right way. Um, there's a whole set of behaviors, and all of them are keeping us from actually building authentic relationships, because we're so busy worrying about being judged ourselves, or judging people, or comparing ourselves to others, or competing. Um, and that all gets us nowhere. And it's funny, as I was growing up, I used to like think something was wrong with me. But the more I began to understand how I had been socialized in this culture, the more I began to see there wasn't something wrong with me, but there was something wrong with the way I had been taught to be in relationship with people. And so for a long time, I've been considering myself an anti-racist organizer. And I had my first undoing racism training back in 1989, I think, by the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. And I bet people in this room know who they are, right? Because they've had a huge impact in your city. But when I was in Austin going on sabbatical, I was also saying to myself, I don't want to work on issues anymore. I want to work on racism and see what happens if we really take that on. So we began bringing the People's Institute to Austin. We trained thousands of people. All of a sudden, people across race lines, age lines, could come together. And we had the same definition of racism. We had the same analysis of the dynamics of power. We had the same understanding of history. And all of a sudden, we could have a conversation that we couldn't have before. Black organizers was like, when my friend uh, Kelly was like, oh man, I don't have to hate white people anymore. And then were other organizers was like, it is safer for us now to be out fighting for what we need, because we know there's a lot of white organizers that will have our back. And if we say to you, go get that cousin, 
We know you'll go get that cousin and help bring him into the fold. A lot has happened over those years in Austin. We had this vision of how to build out that solidarity network. We haven't done it yet. But I have seen a radically different way of our community coming together. So when they tried to move this land development code and gentrify the east side, which has been facing serious displacement, everybody showed up. When we wanted to defeat the police contract, everybody showed up in a nine hour special session with hundreds of us testifying. We got the city council to defeat that police contract. And over the course of a year, we got all the community demands included. We just recently fought back and defeated this whole measure to criminalize homeless people. But even as you make this progress, we got an equity office. Similar, you know, we've been learning a lot from Seattle. The community developed an equity tool where every department in the city's got to evaluate how their money's being spent. And the city actually authorized over $800,000 to do 11 trainings a year for five years so that every Signal City staff person had to go through the training. And the police department are now funding over six trainings to ensure that every commander goes through this training. But trainings aren't enough. And the People's Institute has a principle called building a net that works. A network, building networks, building a net that works to hold us all. And so I've begun to, you know, it's funny, even as I go through this tour, these pieces start coming into my mind more and more. And when I first started really getting active in direct action in civil disobedience, I mean, I had done stuff in high school and college, took over the administration building, did walkouts. I didn't have a language for it, but when I started to do work around the U.S. war in Central America and the, you know, how the people of Nicaragua had overthrown a U.S.-backed dictator and were building a revolutionary government, I got involved in a group called the Pledge of Resistance. Who here has been involved in the Pledge of Resistance, knew about it? Yep, exactly. And you know, I continue to believe that that's one of the most effective models of movement building that I ever had the privilege of participating in. And it also informs my thinking about how might we build out a net that works? How might we build out these solidarity tables? How might we build this movement of movements? And I was, uh, I've been doing a lot of work with Extinction Rebellion. I'm doing a lot of work with a national network of abortion funds. And everybody's trying to figure out how do we build this base that's going to rise up? Because I don't know about y'all. Over all these years of doing all kinds of crazy shit and shutting stuff down, we are in a political moment that I think nothing short of a massive uprising is what is going to be needed. I know that a lot of people are starting to move towards the 2020 elections. All the money's going to go there, and that's important. That is important. Who's in office makes a difference. But we do know that incumbents win. We know the system is rigged. We know the Democrats are capable of losing on their own. And we know that protest and action move people and can move people in how they vote even. So what would it look like if we were to be able to form tables in our communities with representatives from the immigration movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, the trans movements, the reproductive justice movement, the environmental movement? What if we were to start getting all of the people that are their base? Because one of the problems that we deal with with the rise of the nonprofits is that everybody's trying to get people to be in their group. Everybody's trying to compete with each other for who's got the message. So that they, everybody's trying to push their brand so that they can get the money. But when we did the Pledge of Resistance, all of those organizations basically said, you know what, folks? They said to their members, go sign this pledge, get into training, and join this emergency response network. And that training of getting people in affinity groups and spokes councils allowed really large numbers of people to take rapid action. And we had the benefit of the organizations who were tracking the problems who might be able to say, this is the strategic moment and this is the strategic target. 
So what if we could put something like that together today, where if a black person is shot by the police, you look to the Black Lives Matter group to determine the appropriate response for that emergency response network, and we all move. If ICE is raiding a community, we look to the leadership of that movement in, to determine what's the right action. And it feels to me like that should be totally possible. So part of what we're trying to do is figure out new relationships, new structures, rooted in what we can see from history has made all the difference. As I was putting this book together, I was trying to learn a lot more about, I've talked a lot about creating social crisis. And I know that through my experience, where we have actually created a crisis, including here at the WTO in Seattle 20 years ago, it happened because we did actually encourage people to self-organize, to get with their own people, to make decisions for themselves about the risks they were willing to take. I think that that is actually a lesson that has to be carried forward and begun to be integrated in the work we do today. So I'm trying to agitate around that. But this piece about creating crisis, you know, and again, for those of you that were with me on Saturday, apologize for the redundancies, life happens. But there's this new science that's been emerging called complexity science. Does anybody know what that is if I say science of complexity? Right, usually I get everybody nodding their heads. We actually, it's actually permeating our culture and it's all over the place. But we were all raised in a culture that was rooted in Newtonian science. It's very linear, cause and effect, mechanistic. It's how we see the world. But complexity science is the science of organic living systems and how change happens naturally. And as I began to learn more about it, I began to understand it was the science behind why direct action networks work. Because it recognizes that all, there's all these individual agents, affinity groups, cells, whatever, that together make a whole. And that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And it's that, that alchemy of when we come together with people that really is what creates the magic. Because we don't know what's going to happen. <clears throat> but complexity also teaches about the power of feedback, negative and positive. Negative feedback tends to reinforce the status quo. And look at how much negative feedback we give each other and that our movements give each other. But positive feedback, appreciations, gratitude, lifting people up, that's what supports what in complexity science would be called emergence, the new things where things can emerge. Complexity science teaches that there's no one way, there's many ways. That it's not about having a perfect strategy, it's about doing what's doable. And all of these principles lead you to this place called the edge of chaos. Now we're living in a lot of chaos. And we're reacting to it because of the nature of trauma. But what I'm talking about is organized chaos. Again, when we shut down the CIA back in 1987, it was organized chaos. When we blocked the bridges and shut down Washington, D.C., it was organized chaos. When we came to Seattle, it was highly organized chaos. And so I feel like this idea of chaos and crisis really makes people afraid. But unless we are really willing to embrace it and to put our energy into building toward it, I don't think anything radically new is going to emerge. So relationship building, healing of trauma, doing strategic creative organizing, building towards a social crisis, igniting our imagination. I want to just read a little piece about Seattle because I think this really should, you know, tells what was happening there. On the morning of N30, I woke up around 4 o'clock unable to sleep. I ate a good breakfast, 
downed a quick cup of coffee, then bundled up in my blue winter coat and black hat with many layers underneath in case I was arrested. Layers are good in jail, as they tend to be very cold, and if you're just being processed before release, you typically get to wear your clothes. Nadine, Hillary, and I were rolling as a team that day, and we set off around 6 a.m., heading to Victor Steinberg Park, about 10 blocks from the convention center near the waterfront. Hundreds of people were already there. One of my jobs was to inform the crowd of the plan, so I climbed up on top of a van to be seen and heard. Our goal was to assemble into large flying squads that would fly into whatever area of the pie blockades needed assistance. Does anybody know how we shut down Seattle in the pie slices? Does anybody not know? Okay. I wanted everyone to have a shared vision of our mission. In my experience, the more people who hold a common vision, the greater the possibility of it happening. As people streamed into the park, the police harassed us in any way they could. One of the funnier moments was when a group showed up with a giant prop carrot. The police were beside themselves. They were not used to dealing with giant carrots, so they searched the entire group and wouldn't let any of them into the public park. Last time I checked, giant carrots were not against the law. Information started to come in that the blockades were being deployed. The police were reportedly trying to push through, so he knew it was time to fly. I jumped back down the bullhorn and said, we're ready, let's roll. We moved up Virginia Street, turned right on Pike Place, then left onto Pike Street, which would take us straight to the convention center. This was a big commercial area of Seattle with popular stores like Nordstrom and Gap. The back half of our march broke off to support the blockade on the west and south sides of the convention center. Since our numbers were so big, we decided to bring more folks to the north near the Paramount Theater, the location of the opening ceremonies. Once there, we saw that the police had surrounded the theater's entrance with metro buses and a net fence, which we pushed right through. It was about 8 a.m., and from what I could tell, we were effectively shutting everything down. In every direction I looked, there were blockades in place. Some people were making human chains by linking arm to arm, while others locked down to sleeping dragons, which are, the con which are constructed for people to put their arms into and lock onto a bar to be secure inside, which forced the police to cut you out. These tactics were developed by the Deep Woods activists struggling to save old growth forest, and Seattle was the first time that I was aware of them being used in an urban setting. At this point, the police were starting to retaliate, so my friend Nadine left to a safer location. Hiller and I were buddies for the rest of the morning, moving from site to site. A festive atmosphere was taking hold as we swarmed the area. Ladders appeared out of nowhere, and people climbed on top of the buses. There were puppets and flags and giant cardboard ears of corn. Everywhere, people were dressed like butterflies and turtles. I stepped away from the group and took a few minutes to walk around in awe of what was happening. People were free. There was no one in charge, and it was working. I was struck by how otherworldly it was. There was a giant puppet of death and another of a beautiful brown skinned woman who stood tall in her power. I turned the corner to find a giant inflatable whale moving slowly above the crowd. The Infernal Noise Brigade, a radical Seattle marching band, passed by in full formation, wearing furry black hats and jackets. The drum major in front had a green wooden gun that she was twirling with great delight. The sound was incredible. As I continued to move, I came across an intersection with a bunch of young uh, people hula hooping their hearts out in front of a line of police. A giant inflatable earth was being tossed about by the crowd behind them. There were all kinds of crazy signs like clear cut the WTO, World Terrorist Organization, and Don't Trade Our Future. A lone tuba player was set up on a corner playing with a great set of lungs. I hope he stays out of the tear gas, which I caught a whiff of in the air. On another corner, some people were tossing newsstands into the streets and banging on them like drums. Down the street, a group of radical cheerleaders had climbed on a cement wall and were doing a set of radical cheers. My back is aching, my brows too tight, my booty shaking from left to right. Sound off, revolution. There was a queer block, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. Others could be shouting, heard shouting, down, down, WTO. That was the Koreans. Another, around another corner, there was a People's Global Action March from people from the Global South, including farmers from many countries chanting and holding signs. I had been to a lot of protests and mass actions, but never before had I seen this array of movements coming together with a common cause. I made my way back to the front of the Paramount Theater, 
and within minutes I heard the opening of the ministerial had been delayed because delegates could not get in. A roar of celebration could be heard from block to block. Yeah. You know, for me, what we did in Seattle captures like so many of the lessons that are important to carry forward. And if we don't carry them forward, I don't know who is. About two weeks ago, I did an event in Austin, Texas. There were 120 youth in the room. And I asked who knew about the WTO since the anniversary was coming up. Only two people raised their hand. Our history is being wiped out before our eyes. <clears throat> And that's why I'm so grateful for all the organizers here in Seattle and the Indie Media Conference that happened in Houston and there was another conference at Rutgers University that we continue to keep telling these stories. Because we did change the world. The WTO never was able to accomplish what it had hoped and that momentum of being an explicitly anti-capitalist movement was a whole new thing. And I began to realize that so many of the work I had done had been fighting against wars. And wars are really hard, and I consider like militarism the belly of the beast. But the government is really e able to control that playing field by like talking about patriotism and sort of criminalizing us. But the movement against neoliberalism which really rose up with the Zapatistas, spread around the world with People's Global Action, but then just exploded here in Seattle, was going after capitalism, the heart of the beast. And capitalism is a system, the system, that is destroying everything before our eyes, including ourselves. We've come to become addicted to so many things we don't need. And it's that addiction that they continue to foment. And those addictions exist, again, because we live in a culture that is so void of life, so void of spirit, so void of humanity, that we are walking around I mean, I can maybe just speak for myself, but do any of you carry a sense of discontent? A sense of like not being quite whole? Having difficulty finding that place of inner peace and happiness? It's not because it's not accessible to us. It's because we've lost touch with what's really important. We've started to make our choices based on a set of values that promote death. And it's funny because it's not funny. Since we're living under this new administration, again, I don't know about you, but I've been watching more and more people exit this planet. It seems like it's accelerating. I think because people just can't tolerate it. Because it is so overwhelming, we don't know what to do. There are so many, do we, do we try and get the children out of the detention centers? Do we try and stop this climate disaster? Do we try and hold police accountable? Do we try and make sure that women have a right to choose what happens with their bodies? Do we stand up for the rights of queer and trans people to live freely with dignity? Do we try and take care of homeless folks? When I was in DC recently, we were trying, <laughs> we foolishly thought, as I've gone on this tour, I've been agitating around uprising been encouraging people to think about, let's go to DC and shut DC down in April. And then the impeachment proceedings started. And I was like, oh, this is the time. We need to actually take to the streets to force the Democrats to go as far as they will, to hopefully create cover for some of the Republicans to divide, and to also just reignite the power of the people and become that counterforce. So some of us went to DC, <clears throat> we got in conversation with the Women's March and Credo and Move On and By the People and Public Citizen, thinking that, okay, we go to D.C. and hold, stand, our, stand on ground for at least 10 days, maybe people will start coming because we've seen it happen before. So we did it. We had these awesome banners. We had a 600-foot banner of the impeachment clause. 
We were out there every day and nobody came. <laughs> I was so demoralized, I have to say honestly. But what did happen is that thousands of passers-by from all around the world and across the city and across the country came to us so grateful. And it was so clear that people were carrying all of this stuff and they needed to express it. And like photographs were taken and some Hollywood guy came and took a photo of his family in front of the arrest Trump banner and put it on his Instagram. He had over 240,000 likes in a matter of days. So we know the sentiment is there. But what we haven't figured out yet is how do we go from here into the streets and stay? And I've been looking at what are the conditions that enable this stuff to happen. And one of the things that I've realized is like when there's a lot of pain, like Occupy took off because of that financial crisis and then the, uh, the housing crisis, people losing their homes. But right now, at least for most white folks, we know we keep talking about this existential threat. I hardly even know what existential means. But there's this threat of the climate that we know about. But there's not a level of pain that a lot of people are feeling in their immediate embodied space. And I don't want to create pain. <clears throat> but I am trying to figure out what will help all of us make a choice to push ourselves beyond where we've ever gone before. We have a lot of young people rising up trying to ignite us. And many of them, the Sunrise Movement, Future Fridays, the adults that are supporting them, are doing some amazing things. Organizing these climate strikes. But we're watching them do this work and bring out large numbers, but they're not shutting anything down. They're not disrupting business as usual. They're not creating a cost for the people that are promoting and profiting. And they're going home. And then you have Extinction Rebellion, a group that's dear to my heart that I've been working a lot with, that has this idea that we need to shut cities down in order to get these governments to enact a radical plan similar to what happened after World War II, who are trying to do that. But I know that many movements, particularly of young people, if they don't have the intergenerational partners of people that have organized before, it's hard to get there. And, when, and, when, and that's a movement that's predominantly white, haven't had the opportunity to really understand and understand these dynamics of power and oppression and are coming forward with an urgency that yes is needed but urgency is a manifestation of white culture and it can help fuel that savior complex and it can help fuel that idea that mine is the only way we got to do it right now so I have I, I have both hope for what they might be able to do but I also worry about without more people coming into the streets with them and being willing to take a risk, we may not get where we need to go. And a lot of people, like I do, my job is to push you all to take radical risks. But a lot of people come to me and are like, I can't do that. But there are so many ways. With Rumi's, Rumi's poem, there are a hundred different ways to kneel and kiss the ground. And what complexity science teaches, multiple strategies, there is no one way. We need all the ways, and we all can do something. Some of you can sing. Some of you can do art. Some of you can go buy the stuff to make art. Some of you can go dumpster dive to get stuff for props. Some of you can cook food. Some of you can stand outside the jail and give people a hug, chocolate, or a cigarette when they get out. Right? Some of you can give people rides. Some of you can help be part of the medical teams. Like, all of you have something to contribute. And what we've learned, like what we learned in Seattle, is that when we do come together and organize in small groups, and then those small groups link up to other groups, and we push ourselves beyond our comfort zone, we change the world. And this is a world that needs changing. I'm mindful of time, because this is a, I'm, I have a very short block. But I might read one other piece. 
Um, and then we'll open up for questions. This is from Standing Rock. And there's several stories, but I'll just do this one for now. After the Dapple Stockyard action, we continued to organize. <clears throat> Our Action Council and Action Assembly met in the morning at 7 and 8, respectively, and we held action preps to train for specific actions. Hundreds of us continued to come. The assemblies became instrumental in helping people feel informed, connected, and prepared. We promoted the meetings by word of mouth and by posting signs along the road at the kitchens and on the porta potties. As the days and actions went on, more people got involved, some taking on responsibility for publicity, others joining the caravan for prep teams, others taking up art and making props. Our work included civil disobedience actions that shut down the Capitol, the Federal Building, the Bank of North Dakota, the Mandan Police Station, where dozens were arrested protesting the police attack on the night of November 20th, which left hundreds wounded, including Vanessa, who lost her eye, and Sophia, who lost part of her arm. We offered prayers outside the National Guard and marched on NBC and Wells Fargo to confront their lies and immoral investments. We organized to support the massive women's action at the Backwater Bridge and another action at the Stockyard and several actions at Turtle Island. The gaggle, we called ourselves the Action Gaggle, created opportunities to involve more people and develop more accountable leadership in the actions. This is part of the model, creating opportunities for people to step into their power in accountable ways. This included the use of multiple teams like flying squads. These collaborations seemed especially important when you're working with a multicultural group because the model allows people from different backgrounds and camps to team up together. The assemblies became a space to help facilitate discussion and where elders like Faith Spotted Eagle could address the group and see what the work was being done. At times I felt anxious that the action gaggle wasn't in alignment with the desires of the Sioux elders. One day at the end of our action council, I approached one of the elders with tobacco and asked if we could speak. I explained that we had not received permission for all of the actions, yet we were doing the best we could to be in alignment with what the elders had been asked. I was seeking his guidance on how to proceed, and he looked at me and said, you are all doing good work here, and we want this to continue. Whew. I felt relieved, feeling able to release the anxiety. I have learned that when I am uncertain, working in a sacred way with humility and care is what is required. The last major action of the gaggle was the day after Thanksgiving, a plan to converge inside the Kirkwood Mall in Bismarck at exactly 11 a.m. to say a prayer outside the Target store. This was the first action where we announced our location in advance because we needed people to enter the mall in what I call civilian style, alone or in small groups that converge at a predetermined place and time. As 11 o'clock approached, we all moved to the mall and recognized a number of our people as well and that there were a lot of police on high alert. It was obvious someone had tipped them off. Right at 11, about 30 or 40 of us circled up, but the police were on us instantly. They brought in the mall's manager who announced that we had to leave. He basically said there was no religious activity in the mall as the Christmas music and Christmas tree were right around the corner. A moment or two passed and then the police grabbed two people. We began to move as a group toward the exit, chanting softly, but as we approached the door, the police tore at us, throwing people to the ground. They tackled Noah, a member of the action group who was differently abled and used crutches. At least four cops took him down. The police threw me to the ground hard, and the next thing I knew, they were cuffing my wrist with zip-tied plastic cuffs. It was done with such a vengeance and anger, and I knew immediately I was in trouble as the cuffs were extremely tight. A young woman who had been arrested was sobbing against the wall. Most of the standers by in the hotel had a look of shock on their face. I finally convinced a cop to get some clipper, clippers to change my cuffs, but they were so tight he, could, he couldn't even get the clippers under them. I was lucky because they eventually got them cut off. And when they cuffed me again, it was still tight, but at least I had circulation. They moved us outside to the mall and started to take our and bag our property. We saw them steal phones and money. As they, we were placed in vans, I was so grateful to see our local observers on the scene, taking notes, trying to get information. We were brought to, brought to the Mandan jail and put in chain link pens. After a while, it became clear that they were going to ship us four hours away to Fargo. Hours passed before they boarded us on buses with a policewoman, a policeman, and two National Guards. <clears throat> it was a difficult ride. We were bruised, tired, and hungry. Some of us were crying. 
Fortunately, the policewoman allowed us to change seats so that we could calm each other down and re-anchor ourselves using our breath. The police knew it was a bad situation and they finally stopped at a police station maybe two hours from Bismarck to let two of the women out. We reached Fargo before midnight, exhausted. One of the women had actually been shopping in the mall with her boyfriend and got caught unwittingly up in the arrest. She was stressed because they had two dogs in the car. We worked together making calls to friends using a phone card the police gave us, as well as the legal office, and we learned that the dogs had been, were okay. Soon news came that we would be bonded out and that a network of families in Fargo would pick us up. This is the magic of community-supported direct action. A whole network had been advocate, activated to work on our behalf. We started to be released at 2 a.m. We were taken to a family's home where we found food, beds to sleep in, a shower, hugs, and love. It was hard to make sense of all of what had happened, but I knew that through our arrest, our brutal the brutality, our I knew that though our arrest was brutal, our privilege had prevented even greater harm. We were battered but alive, and we had a community to embrace us on our return home. There was so much violence at Standing Rock. And it just brought to life that for the indigenous people who have been struggling for sovereignty and protecting of their lands, that the, that the history is the present, is the future until we change it. And that struggle there helped people all around this country and world know that all the indigenous people, although it was between 30 to 40 million, were murdered with the founding of this nation that many indigenous tribes are still fighting against the pipelines, destruction of the water. Even here in your city, the protectors of the Salish Seas are working so hard to get your governor to take action. He says he's about climate justice, but is not taking action. And I want all of you to think about how can you support the indigenous organizing that's trying to stop the climate destruction in this area and to restore the rivers and the lakes so the salmon can continue to run free. So, this work is hard. When you stand in your power and organize against the state, when you take on racism, white supremacy, they strike back. That's why we have to go together. That's why we have to do the healing or else we're going to lose each other. With this climate crisis, we don't know where the state's going to go. But we do know, just today, I don't know if any of you saw this news, you ever hear the Climate Emergency Fund Foundation, these rich people that started a fund for our movements? It turns out the founder of the Climate Emergency Fund is also part of another business with ex-CIA agents that are mining for data to protect corporate brands against this fight around climate. And so now we're saying, was this set up? Because so many people submitted applications with names and strategies and information. We have to be smart about what we're doing. We have to get offline. We have to get face to face. We have to have our lists in hand. We need to know where we're going to meet up. We need to know who's got the generators or the walkie talkies. And that's all can be done before the shit goes down. So let me just leave it there for now. I'll do a close at the end. But let me just see if there's any questions, comments, wonderings, opportunities you can share for what people can do. All these issues, they're all connected up. So, uh, you know, there's really only one thing. And, uh, but we got to get everybody together. And, um, well, from my little world, from my perspective, um, I belong to a, a coalition of, of, of peace activists, and we gather down at the federal building uh, every the first Tuesday of every month, and we uh, protest. We have our banners and everything. But, um, we are, we're part of, it's a coalition and it includes Ground Zero 
Center for Nonviolent Action, which I've uh, been a part of for many years, uh, since 1978, and we've been protesting at the, uh, we've been three times a year, we shut down, uh, you know, symbolically, the Trident submarine base, and uh, we, we block the gate, basically, and people get arrested. But um, anyway, but, 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 but I think that's only one little piece, you know, but the but I think the big thing, the two biggest pieces are the uh, nuclear weapons and the uh, climate change. And that, okay, right now, uh, what, what's happened just today was that 350.org joined our coalition. And so that we're at, we've always wanted to get the climate and the nuclear weapons, you know, the, the climate change and nuclear weapons married into a, a large, a lo you know, together because in, in the Extinction Rebellion, I think that says it. I don't know how to get part, I, I'd like to become part of that. I don't know, and have our group all become part of that because I think, you know, we, we've got to get something bigger, way bigger than the WTO even. You know, we've got to get it, the, the revolution has to include all the people who are aware of, of from their particular perspective. So I guess my question is, how do we hook it all up and, um, you know, and get, how do we shut down the Trident submarine base? How many LNG. people would it take? Uh, uh, filling Kitsap County uh, to, to shut that place down, you know? Uh, anyway, I guess that's, I don't know. I didn't, it's kind of like I need, I need to know where to start and how to get it, to get everything together. I know that's a big question, and anybody, nobody really knows, probably knows the answer, maybe. But I just wonder what your, what your view of it would be. Well, one of the pieces is for us to not think that our issues are the most important. Because there are many different communities that are, have a different lived experience and that are fighting for their lives. And so if we try and make center nuclear power and nuclear weapons as the issue, it's not gonna happen. And again, I, can, I don't know how you do it exactly, but I do know that when we started to take on racism and white supremacy, it connected us all. So I think it's really important, particularly for those of us that are white, to really uh, begin to undo our own socialization. Can I clarify? I didn't mean that those are the most important. I just meant that those are the two biggest threats that could wipe out the planet. Okay, so not the most important, but the two biggest threats that could wipe out the planet. <clears throat> That's your perspective on it, and it, there's truth to your perspective. Other people may have a different perspective. And it doesn't matter. It's okay. But I think part of it is like, um, uh, Angela Arian had this, the four ways of the warrior. Show up, pay attention, speak your truth, and stay unattached to outcome. We get so attached to some of the things that we're working on that we can lose sight of other people's experience and what's important to them. Which is why I talked a little bit about, I think part of where we need to go in the future is this sort of solidarity table where it's not a coalition on one particular issue or group, but it's a recognition of our interconnectedness and that I do believe that these issues of supremacy do tie us all together. And so I, do, so I think part of it is for those of us who are white, learning to become explicitly anti-racist in our work. And all of the oppressions are bad, but when you add race and gender and race and class, right, the outcomes are so much greater. Um, so I think that's a key piece because without us doing that work, coming together in a multiracial, multi-issue coalition, we're going to continue to replicate some of the patterns that make it hard for us to stay together. Because we might not be listening, we might speak too much, and so part of it, again, is that <clears throat> I hear white people a lot talk about how do we, like, uh, you know, we talked the other day about allies versus accomplices. I hear white people say, you know, how do we lift communities up? And part of it, as our job, is to decenter ourselves and to just create space, but to keep showing up. So 
the other way I would answer your question is there's nothing, there's no way around or through this other than organizing and building relationships. So, and those building those relationships are about showing up for other people's struggle, getting to know people, you know, in, particularly in terms of like uh, indigenous struggles, it's important to show up and just do what you are asked. What, what are we being asked to do? Um, Reverend Seku in, in Ferguson basically said to all the white folks, apologize that it took you so long to show up. Because it's hard for those of us that have been in the movement our whole life, struggling, throwing down, fighting for stuff. You know, we're like the A-team. We're the good folks, right? But we don't realize how much we ourselves perpetuate harm. And it doesn't mean we're bad people, right? But it means that we have some that healing work to do as well, to, so that we can be in, again, language that I would, you know, I really learned and was gifted you know, through the elders at Standing Rock, is like being in right relationship. Elders to youth, white folks to people of color, straight folks to trans folks, queer folks. So holding a vision, building relationships, showing up for other movements, beginning to have conversations, looking at what ties us all together. And again, it's like if we could build these tables, if something goes down around the Trident thing and you've got a relationships and emergency response, people will come. So it's organizing and building those relationships. Yeah. Um, I don't mean to be redundant, but I just wanted to answer. When you were speaking, you said, I'm not sure I understand what existential threat means. It's right in the word, and you said it all evening. Will we exist? The threat is, will we even exist at the end of this? Some things are, can we make the world a little better? Some things are, that's not fair, but that is, will we exist as a species or as a planet? So, I mean, nuclear was that at times, other wars, but now the, um, the threat is much bigger, more palpable to a lot of people. And what I wanted to mention on that from me as a child growing up, I never trusted my own intuition. I listened to the culture, I listened to the adults, I listened to the elders, and when I made decisions, I knew what the right thing was. I mean, what I shouldn't do, what I should move towards, and quite often I did what other people expected, and got the job, went to school, did this, stayed out of trouble, and as I've gotten older, I realized in every single one of those situations, my first intuition was right. And so I think, a biggest, a bigger thing we can do is how do we help younger people get to that place quicker so that they can find a reason to take part in this because now I'm hearing people say I'm not having kids because what's the point you know things like that and I've never heard that in my life before. Right. Yeah I think it's a, it's a good thing for adults to consider bringing kids into this earth and thank you for explaining existentialism um, and our existential threat. Um, and I know I'm going to now develop some new language because a lot of people may not know what that means, you know? And so we need to be very clear on how we're communicating. I also want to just say I appreciate you also sharing this idea of trusting our intuition and recognizing that, you know, in the overculture, we are raised to like do what everybody thinks we should do as opposed to trusting ourselves. And I really believe that that trust and that intuition is as we tap into our higher powers. And we have to trust that. Um, so, so thanks for sharing those things. Back here and then up here. If you could um, have all the direct actions in the next year, do one thing differently, or one thing more, or one thing better, hmm. what would that thing be? Well. I would, um, I would swarm the White House and stay. I would, I would swarm the White House and stay. You know, even the Women's March coming up in January, they're talking about, you know, bringing a lot of people, but the, one group going to do repo rights, one doing immigration, one doing this. And I feel like if we're looking at what's happening around the world, Puerto Rico, Chile, Bolivia, Hong Kong, you know, Iraq, Iran, like where is our people's uprising in light of everything that is happening. 
And so what I would do, though, is in that process of swarming and staying in large numbers, it would be similar to what happened in Tahrir Square. Again, we know that self-organizing will be happening, but I would very intentionally be making sure that there was infrastructure to convene lots of spaces for learning and sharing and building relationships and doing trauma work and doing, you know, so that it's like, it's not just resistance against the state the whole time, but we're actually building the community. It's similar to what happened at Standing Rock. There was, it was a container for people to do, you know, to be of service, to build relationships, um, to get more deeply rooted in a practice of uh, working in a, a way with consent. Um, and again, I think, and maybe I'll, I'll answer your question also by another gift from the elders at Standing Rock. You know, they helped us understand that we weren't protesters, but that we were protectors. And I carry that with me all the time because I think that when we understand that we're protectors of what we love, that gives us a force. And so, you know, I want to go shut down the White House and, and force a shift in power by us going to protect what we love, which is the land and each other, and to be there in a beloved community. And I, and because I, I don't see us doing anything else that's going to make the difference in the time that we have. And even if we get rid of him, you know, we should be there the day after the election as well, right? We just, it's like, we've got to hold, uh, I want to say people's feet to the fire, but I also recognize, and I talk a lot about how we got to go through the fire, but there's no time for messing around. There's no time for all this other stuff anymore. Because even once we can get the political will to do the right thing, there's then a whole phase of implementation at a rapid rate. So, yeah, that's what I would do. Go shut it down together, one big group. How are yeah. you going to get everybody there to the White House? How come? Well, what I've seen, again, over many mobilizations, is that when you take a piece of ground and you stay there, if the right moment, people come. You saw it at Standing Rock, you saw it at Ferguson, you saw it at Occupy, right? And so, that's part of it. You've seen it all around the world. It doesn't have to be millions of people. It could start with hundreds and grow to thousands and tens of thousands. We saw it at Camp Casey, the anti-war movement. Cindy Sheehan sat down over a month's time, thousands and thousands of people, literally, driving on the road, er, driving there. When we were in D.C., even we didn't get numbers, we were out in the streets honking horns, people literally would park their cars and come join us. So it's like doing something that is going to excite people, knowing they have a need, and then, and then, then really, if we're going to do this, your community needs to organize and figure out how you're going to support people going and what resources they can bring. We have to start going back to that basic grassroots organizing of supporting each other and taking these actions for those that can go and those that can't go. Oh yeah, that's easy. I agree with you on grassroots organizing. Um, so Becca, you might add to this question. Um, so you've been talking a lot about Standing Rock. Um, I was lucky enough to be in a small group with some uh, uh, some traditional people from the reservation, very critiquing a lot of some of the white people who came who were not organized but saw themselves in small organized groups and did some things that were very disrespectful, one being um, something to do with um, a sacred area where people were buried, where people marched anyway, even though the elders didn't. So there's a balance that has to be taken to build grassroots organizing and allow people to move, but there has to be some sense of, just, just don't organize your little thing and not here. And I know you're talking about being anti-racist and doing that. But in these movements, there has to be some a bigger direction and, and training of people who are there. So there were some mistakes that were made. It wasn't all um, perfect. Um, fast forward to Seattle, um, what we need to do is a standing rock here around LNG um, in Tacoma. And there's an intersection there with the fact that if the LNG plant blows up, people within a third of the mile will die. And the detention center, the one of the largest detention center of immigrants, are, is right in that field. So we have something right here to do. But I think there's a balance of 
building grassroots without having sensitivity and that takes a lot of work because there can be mistakes. Um, yes, there's always going to be mistakes. There was a lot of really difficult things that happened at Standing Rock internally, different strategies. I mean, many indigenous communities don't, like direct action is not necessarily language they would use or embrace. That There was a lot of dynamic between elders and young people uh, around, you know, what are the risks? Is, it, is prayer enough? Right, so it's like, and there was a lot of trauma and a lot of reaction. So uh, it was a very painful time. And Mark actually even wrote a piece that's like, what do you do when your elders are wrong, right? So yeah, I mean, so I think part of it, again, is like the more aware we can become of the pitfalls that have been set up for us, and the more we can figure out how to have spaces where we can actually really have dialogue about our different lived experience and worldviews, um, the more likely we'll be able to get, not have to repeat some of those mistakes. That dialogue is really critical. It's just not unleashing, come and do anything. It's that there has to be that dialogue and training for people to be intersecting with another community. Yeah. And, there, and there has to be room for dis difference as well. We don't, we can't all do the same thing, right? So, so yeah, no question. And I'm sure there's been many things written and stories and lessons that people are still taking away from that. And I always say you have to hold the horror and the awe. There was a lot of horror and there was amazing amounts of awesome things that took place. I'm just curious, do you have a vision? Like, we can tear this down? What are we, what are we looking to build it. up? <laughs> and, and how is that, is that part of this organizing or what are you thinking about that? Yep, I definitely think there's, yes, they, simultaneous. So when we, like in Seattle, there was a space. Within that space, you could get medical care, you could get food, you could do artistic work, you could get training, you could get support for your children, right? You could get legal support, right? Same thing we did in Katrina. We built a parallel society that was rooted not in buying things from one another, but exchanging things. I talk a lot about how I think jobs are the problem because they hook you into that system and they're not meaningful work. That what we need is meaningful work and our needs met. And so what you can see in almost any massive uprising is that people self-organize and show up with what they can do. There will always be food that shows up. There's always going to be people to do medical work. So, and it's not their job. They're coming out of a sense of service and gifting. There are many models of gift economies. So when I think about the future, I think more about bioregionally. How are we able to get from one place to another place in a bike ride of a day? Like, there's so many skills that we used to have in, in, in this world, you know, living off of the land, canning foods, plumbing, <laughs> permaculture stuff. Like, there's a lot of wisdom that already exists. Like, the solutions all exist. It's about whether or not we're willing to start putting them into practice more. Because it's not just about turning off your lights and recycling. That's good. But we actually have to start developing these other means of self-care for our communities and ourselves and sharing of stuff. You know, if I'm hungry, you know, and, and honestly, if you look, go to, a, if you go to a poor community, like, there are different economies that exist there, different social networks, because they're needed for people to survive. And so there was life before capitalism. There are cultural, there are many different cultures that still live without being rooted into a capitalist state. So it's there. We just have to learn to share in many ways. And that we don't need all of this stuff. And that we actually, I think I started to say before, but I didn't maybe get there, is like a homeless woman started joining our protests. And it was getting really cold, so I invited her to stay in my hotel room because she was awesome. 77-year-old um, woman. And we've been trying to find housing for her since we've left because it was like 26 degrees the week after. So we helped scrap money together and get her in a hotel. Two people froze to death the night after we got her in the hotel room in Washington, D.C. And she was a bus driver for 46 years, totally clear. And we've been trying to figure out a place for her to live. It's unbelievable the obstacles that get created for people. That For those of us that are housed and have resources, we have no idea how much the system is set up. And it's like, this is an incredible woman full of dignity. She just needs a place to sleep. 
And now the hotel is even trying to run her out because she, some of her homeless friends came to visit her because when you're homeless, you have a community. No, and they're not even staying there. But it's like, she's like, I was with my community. I disappeared the hotel room. They wanted to come see me because she's like the mama. But it's like, I'm, I'm myself looking at how hard it is to just take care of basic human needs. And it's like, somebody's got an extra bed. But they haven't been willing to offer it yet. So we'll keep trying. We'll keep trying. Yep. Any other things? If not, I think we need to wrap up. I've been getting signs in the back. <laughs> yeah, wrap up time. Listen, I really want to express my appreciation to all of you who came out here tonight, uh, for people that have continue to do the organizing, for people that are going to go start doing more organizing, go after your governor, make him do the right thing, shut down the Trident thing, shut down LNG, right? Become this moving, powerful force, and that some of you might join us in DC in April. Extinction Rebellion is talking about, do we just go to DC and shut it down? So, as I like to say, let us take each other's hands and walk through the fire, and by doing so, we'll heal ourselves and the land. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.